Welcome to Mastering Your Money. I'm Ed Fulbright, CPA PFS. This is where personal and business finances meet for your independence plan. I've been asked by our listeners to remind everyone to get a notepad and pencil because we're a financial education program to turbocharge your drive on the Financial Freedom Highway. If you have a question, need help finding your way onto the Financial Freedom Highway, or just want more information about Mastering Your Money shows, visit MasteringYourMoney.com for business and personal finance ideas. Sign up for our free e-newsletter and check out our Mastering Your Money online section for old shows. If you're worried about your job and have you ever thought about understanding what the company's big picture is and how you fit in it? Sure you haven't, and most people don't, but you can. If you work for a publicly traded company, it's relatively easy to get their company financials and you can find other, other things out about the company because they're in the public domain. But if you work for a smaller organization, this may be a bit more difficult. In a few minutes, we'll find out the five drivers you need to know in order to start having an impact on the bottom line. Joining us for our discussion on what is your vision is Kevin Cope, who is on the phone from his Orem, Utah office. Kevin is the founder of Acumen Learning, the leader in small in business Acumen training. He has delivered courses in more than 25 countries and to more than 65,000 people in 25 years. Kevin has promoted the idea that the brightest minds in the business understand the essence of how a company makes money and use this knowledge to impact the bottom line. He is the author of Seeing the Big Picture, Business Acumen to Build Your Credibility, Career, and Company. Welcome to Mastering Your Money, Kevin Cope. Thank you, Ed. Pleasure to be aboard. Well, good. I'm glad you could take time out of your busy schedule. Now, Kevin, your book is entitled Seeing the Big Picture, Business Acumen to Build Your Credibility, Career, and Company. Your book sounds great for the business owner, but how can employees use it to help their employers? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, in our work, and you mentioned we worked with uh, tens of thousands of individuals on this. Uh, Here's what we found. Uh, we found that when it comes to some of the basic measures of any business, whether it be that large corporation or a small business, the average individual isn't real clear on how their company makes money. Okay. And if they're not real clear on that money-making process, then they tend to be less engaged. Okay. And if they're less engaged, they tend to be less impactful in the business. So our experience is they tend not to have that connect to the business, to that big picture. Um, They may be really good at sales, or they might be good at IT or marketing, but making that connect to how do they, on how they drive business results, uh, just isn't there. And so we really work with individuals and organizations to help really bridge that gap to create that line of sight. Okay. Now, some of our listeners may not be familiar with business acumen, so can you kind of define that for our listeners? Yeah, we define business acumen as seeing the big picture of how your company or any company makes money and then making good decisions around that money making process. Okay. And so this if you work for a nonprofit or you work for a university, I I think this could still apply very very much because they still have to have some of the key drivers that you talk about. Yeah, no question. They they may adapt them just slightly differently, and we've worked with uh, many uh, non-for-profits or non-profits, and so the model still fits that. It just may be adapted a little bit differently based on their circumstance. Sure, sure. In fact, I always think that non-profits, that's kind of a misnomer, because if they don't don't make a profit, they will soon be out of business. So. Yeah, no question. <laughs> they have to bring in more revenue than they spend in right, their expenses, right. and they might not call it profit. They might call it an addition to reserve or something other than profit, but even, you know, the, the so-called non-for-profits still <laughs> have to bring in more money than they spend. To right, survive. right. I mean, that's that's some of the basics. So uh, just from our conversation, our listeners probably can pick up that one of your drivers is profits. So let's tell our listeners what the other four are. 
Yeah, um, and so it may help if I give you a, a bit of a visual. In okay. These, in these five business drivers, um, the origin of these is really the financial statements that all companies focus on. Uh, when you listen to executives or business owners, these are the things that they think about. They might not put it in my same terminology, but they still manage the business this way. And maybe think of a diamond shape. And right at the top of the diamond, the top point in the diamond, um, cash is the first business driver. If you go to the right point, profit is the second business driver. And, uh, you know, when I, we mentioned profit, people call it earnings or income. And I love the idea of no margin, no mission. So uh, even those nonprofits, any organization, if they have a phenomenal mission and they can't make money actually performing as an organization, they can't fulfill their mission. So profit is key. At the bottom point, the third business driver is assets. And we saw in the Great Recession here, you know, that started in December of 2007 and ended in June of 2009, although we're still feeling the effects of that, companies that didn't have asset strength, like AIG, Citibank, Freddie May, uh, Fannie Mae, and Freddie Mac, if they don't have asset strength, they can't survive. So that's the third business driver. On the left point, our fourth business driver is growth. And we find that growth is critical for organizations to stay innovative. I mean, Apple right now is a great example of uh, the ability to grow a business over time. And then right in the center of the diamond, our fifth business driver is people. And people refers to both employees of an organization as well as the customers they serve. So those five, again, cash, profit, assets, growth, and people. Okay. And, and that makes that makes a lot of, lot of sense. Now... You know, as someone would always tell you, how do you measure uh, each of these drivers? Because you shouldn't set it as a driver uh, unless you can measure it. Right. Yeah, and so each one of them, I find that most organizations have one, two, maybe three specific measures around each of these drivers. And so let me give you and maybe one or two for each one of these on cash. Most companies really look at the amount of cash they have on hand as well as they look at the cash generation from their operations. So those are two key measures that you really un ought to understand about your business, cash on hand and then cash flow. On profit, most organizations, they track their sales and they tra track their bottom line profit. And then a, a key one I like to look at is how much profit do you make for every dollar of revenue? They call that the net profit margin. Right. Average company right now is at about 13%. Okay. And so that's another measure. And, and it's interesting how, you know, for example, Apple's about 22%. Uh, Microsoft's about 30% profit margin. And then you have Walmart that might be only 3.5% profit margin and Costco only about 1.7%. And companies operate very differently in a high profit margin environment uh, than they do in a low profit margin environment. So profit margin is a key for that measure. I got you. On assets, there are two measures I like there. I like return on assets. In other words, how effectively do you use your assets to generate a profit for the company? Okay. And then I also like the equity ratio when you're talking about assets. How much debt do you have against your assets? Therefore, how much equity do you have in your assets? And it's a measure of uh, how leveraged, how much borrowing a company may look at. When you look at growth, that fourth business driver, I like revenue growth and profit growth, those two measures. Uh, you know, coming back to Apple, um, it, this last year, they're, they're already about a $100 billion in sales organization. They grew sales 65%. They grew their profit 85% in this last year, which is just unprecedented. That is. Yeah. And then finally, with people, every organization likes to measure that differently. There's a couple that I uh, like. I like employee retention. In other words, uh, you know, are you able to keep the good employees in the company, or do you tend to lose, you know, have high uh, employee turnover? Uh, you could look at revenue per employee or profit per employee, and so those are uh, some measures that you might look at for each of those five business drivers. Okay, and that makes sense. I, you know, I think really, uh, you know, a lot of people like to say a lot of things about sales and cash on hand, but if your people, uh, which I think is probably the most critical part of it, because you, most, 
especially service-oriented or product-oriented type companies, if you people are executing on whatever the strategy is or implementing, if you don't have good people or great people, then it's going to be difficult for you to have the cash to, to make the margins and get to where you want to get to. Is, is that, would that be, um, would, what's your opinion? Uh, it's, it's a great point, and I completely agree, and that's why people are at the center of the model. Okay. I, I mentioned them last but not least. They're actually right in the center, and they drive, as you were indicating, all of the others. If you've got great employees connecting well with the customer, then they'll drive cash, profit, assets, and growth. And so they really are critical in making all of that happen. I, I love uh, kind of Southwest Airlines as an example of that. Uh, if you've flown on a Southwest Airlines flight, um, their people are – the culture is just different. You can tell right off the bat. It's interesting because Southwest Airlines has been profitable every year in their 45-year history, which is amazing for an airline. Yes. Uh, airlines just struggle these days. They've never had a loss, an annual loss. And as a result, they've never had a layoff. And so it's a great example of how a strong culture of people – are able to drive uh, profit year in and year out. They drive growth. You know, they've just, uh, they're in the process of acquiring AirTran. And so they're a great example of a culture that's hard to uh, replicate and a culture that's able to drive the other business drivers. Uh, other airlines have tried to copy the Southwest model, and most of them have failed. I think they can copy some of the strategies, but what they can't match is that culture of people, and they have a great connect and a loyal following with customers. Well, you know, I think that's really critical. And, and in fact, some of the municipalities or uh, government organizations, I've, I've become fairly concerned that they um, are, are going to experience great problems when, when the economy starts to rebound because their people are going to abandon them pretty quickly if just because of the um, way they've been treated during this 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 crisis, I, I, I believe, because they haven't gotten raises in a while. Um, you know, they've gotten some bonuses, um, but I just see some challenges coming up for for our government entities. Yeah, you know, along that lines, and I would in, incorporate both the government and uh, for-profit businesses out there. I was reading in USA Today. Oh, this has been about six months ago. And the article cited that uh, in surveying, and these are people with the job yes. from all, across all sectors, people in the job. And what this research found, 38% of people currently employed believe they'll be somewhere else in the next 12 months. All right. Meaning, you know, they've got their resumes kind yes. of prepared, sharpened, and when the opportunities emerge, uh, you know, they'll be out looking. And, and what was also interesting is the article cited that most employers don't realize this. In other words, they think employees are just happy to have a job right now. Right. Whereas employees, as you described, uh, boy, there's been a lot of pressure put on them. Right. Uh, not a lot of pay increases, more is expected of them. So, boy, this, this article really validated what you were describing. Well, great. Uh, for those of you who've just joined us, the name of the program is Mastering Your Money. I'm Ed Fulbright, CPA PFS, and we've been discussing What is Your Vision with Kevin Cope. He's the author of Seeing the Big Picture, Business Acumen to Build Your Credibility, Career, and Company. Do you have questions on your finances? You may email them to info at masteringyourmoney.com. And for more information about Mastering Your Money shows, visit masteringyourmoney.com for business and personal finance ideas. Sign up for our free e-newsletter and check out our Mastering Your Money online section for old shows. We'll be back in a few to teach you more lessons on strengthening your independence plan. Excuse me, do you know how to get to Maine and Maple? Do you have these in a seven and a half? How is that cooked? Can I get that shipped overnight? Is there a direct flight? How long does the warranty last? What's your soup of the day? How do you change the ringtone? Does it come in blue? Does this bus stop at Elm Street? We ask questions everywhere in life. Is it raining out? Uh, what time's the meeting? How much does this cost? Does it have four-wheel drive? Have we met before? What's my account balance? Yet somehow, when we get to the doctor's office... Any questions? Um, no. 
we clam up. Ask questions. What is this test for? Are there any side effects? When do I get my results? Questions lead to better health care. Go to ahrq.gov for a list of 10 questions everyone should know. Questions are the answer. Public service announcement brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and the Ad Council. This is 90.7 FM WNCU. Welcome back to Mastering Your Money. I'm Ed Fulbright, CPA, PFF. What is your vision? With Kevin Cope, he's the author of Seeing the Big Picture, Business Acumen to Build Your Credibility, Career, and Company. And in the first half, we talked about what are the five drivers in order to uh, really make your business become successful and to develop the big uh, business. Uh, The idea is that, let's picture it. You have a diamond, and at the top of the diamond, you have cash. That's the money you have in the bank uh, or what you're generating from your operations. On the right, you have the uh, profit. That's what the profit that you make from your your business and uh, that. And at the bottom, you have your assets. What quality are they? And then if you go to the left side in the middle, You have the growth of the business. And right in the center is the people that work in the business. So that's the five drivers. And I can't tell you how critical those things are, but, um, Kevin, I want to bring you back in because one of the questions we didn't get to ask you in the first half is, how do you link these five drivers to form a big picture for your company? Yeah, it's a great question. You know, these five drivers are really interdependent in nature. You might focus on one, but if you do, it will have a ripple effect on the other. So, for example, uh, prior to the recent downturn, uh, most companies were probably focused, number one, on growth, and number two, on profit. Okay. Um, Yeah, and so when the the economic downturn hit, instantly, uh, almost immediately, companies kind of refocused on two things. They refocused on cash. Because if they didn't have cash, they didn't survive. And we saw, for example, General Motors yes. uh, take tens of billions of dollars in government bailout money. And so they immediately shifted to uh, cash and also the strength of their assets or the lack thereof. Sure. And now that we're coming out of the, uh, you know, this great recession, or at least we're bumping along a little bit, you know, there's some positive signs. The focus is kind of shifting to profit and then growth. And so uh, it, it really depends on where a company is in its life cycle. But the key in seeing the big picture of these five is recognize that they're very interdependent in nature. You can't ignore any one of them over time or you might run into trouble. Uh, Toyota found that um, they had to refocus on the customer a couple of years ago yes. because there was a loss of trust with quality. Yes. So that was a refocus for them. Um, and so you can get a sense of if you focus in one area, it, it may have that ripple effect on the others. Okay. And, and that makes sense. And, you know, how do you balance them all? Because it sounds like when you're trying to pull this big picture for the, the company together, it's sort of like a balancing act. If you want to focus more on profit and, and growth, then you may be giving up a little bit in the cash area or uh, you may be loosening the quality of your assets. And you kind of got to figure out what that balance is. How, how do you do all of that? Well, yeah, it's a great point. For example, uh, you know, most executives or most business leaders, especially if they have shareholders or they're a public company, if you ask the CEO what's your goal, and most of them will say long-term profitable growth. So they'll mention profit and growth. In order to do that, and, and I would suggest with these, you're not always in perfect balance. You might, you might swing one way and then have to kind of retrench a little bit. But if you've got an executive or a business owner that really is after profitable growth, you've got to recognize, as you mentioned, that when you're growing, it actually takes cash yes. because you're investing back in the business. Maybe you're trying to acquire other businesses, so it takes a lot of cash. You also have to have good profit margins while you're focused on growth. Um, A a company that might be over-focused on growth, and this reminds me of the dot-com boom and then bust back in the late 1990s, uh, early 2000s. They were so focused on growth, most of them weren't turning a profit, and so they burned through their cash. Yes. So it wasn't sustainable. And so um, if a company is focused on growth, you've got to have good cash, you've got to have good profit margins to sustain that, and asset strength. 
And so a good sign that maybe you're out of balance is you see cash positions dropping, you see your profit margins start to disappear, and you find on the asset side you're borrowing too much money. That may be an indication that you need to possibly slow your growth or rethink about growth in order to balance out you know, those other three business drivers. Okay. And so you, you've really got to make sure that your measures are – uh, very sound um, because, uh, you know, when we think about this, you, you talked about GM going out of business. Well, GM knew they had a problem probably two to three years before they ended up uh, in government hands. And so, you know, the big thing is is that they couldn't stop their free fall uh, simply because they had so many contracts. And I guess they had pissed off their people. Um, so much because they they didn't have the trust of the people, and I guess that's uh, you know, a big issue for for people. What what's your opinion? Yeah, you know, and, and it's interesting to contrast GM with Ford. Yes. Now, Ford had the same challenges, meaning um, you know, oil prices shot up, and so their big trucks and their SUVs weren't selling. That's where they make most of their money. Um, they also saw the economic down cycle really. Uh, drop demand. But it's interesting, Ford, um, while GM declared bankruptcy, they took billions in government bailout money. Um, they, their CEO, Rick Wagner, was fired by President Obama. Ford got through very differently. Yes. And the difference is um, their CEO, uh, Alan Mulally, he came over from Boeing in 2006. One of the first things he did is he recognized uh, that they were a bit vulnerable. Yes. Um, GM didn't if they did recognize that they didn't take enough action, but the CEO, you know, Alan Mulally of Ford went out and borrowed twenty three billion dollars <laughs> while borrowing was still uh, you know no, the, the ability to do it was there. Yes. A- and that cash position made all the difference for him. Yes. And so uh, I, I think, as you described GM's situation, I, they really kind of imploded almost on all five of those business drivers. They didn't have enough cash. Therefore, they couldn't fund any growth nor pay their bills, so their asset strength dropped. Their profit margins, they turned negative. They were losing money, so certainly they weren't growing. Employees couldn't be paid, uh, and, and, you know, and also the, uh, whether it be union or non-union. Uh, the ability to negotiate effective contracts for them uh, didn't exist, and so GM kind of imploded on all five of those. Yes. Now Ford, while their profit margins went negative and they weren't growing, they had the cash to sustain them until they were able to turn that picture around, and they have in the last few quarters. Right, and that made a huge difference. I mean, they they went to Congress just like GM did. But their point was is that if it continues to be where nobody's buying cars, then, yeah, we're going to be in trouble. But, you know, we just need a line of credit to keep us going. We don't need to file bankruptcy. Yeah, and as a matter of fact, they opted not to take that line of credit. Right. Um, it was there um, as a backstop, but they decided, you know what, we think it's better off having no strings attached with the government and doing this on our own. And, and that makes a lot of sense. But I think one of the other things that Ford or, or Malali did, well, first, I have to give uh, Bill Ford the credit that he was uh, smart enough to know when he didn't know enough to and bring somebody in that was smart enough to to do the hard task that he wasn't ready to do. Yeah, great point. And so the uh, but Malali would hold people's people to to the fire. He he had managers that would tell, "Oh, everything's great in um, at Ford and blah blah blah. There's nothing wrong." And he said, "Well, then why in the heck are we lose still losing money if nothing's wrong?" Yeah, and so. You got your managers then to come forth and tell the honest to God truth. Well, yeah, we do have this problem over here, this problem over there. Well, if you know what the problems are, we can fix it. And so everybody starts to fix it and you start to work as a team and it becomes a very cohesive uh, group. And that's why they were able to avoid filing bankruptcy. And you just reinforce the point as to why people are in the center of this model. Yes. <laughs> you can take the same external factors, the same business environment, the same economic conditions, but if you've got the right people employees that are able to connect with emplo- uh, with uh, customers, uh, they can then overcome a myriad of external uh, realities 
uh, you know, as we've just described with Ford and GM. Sure, sure. And and that makes a lot of sense that people are really the key in any organization and they've got to feel like they can talk about, uh, be honest about the problems in a company without being fired or, or kicked to the curb. And, and that's that's the real big thing. And it takes a pretty big manager to be able to, to listen to that because sometimes the managers get criticized. Yeah, they do. And, you know, as long as an individual is able to focus on that big picture, you know, as I was mentioning earlier, I think where people in organizations can get a little bit lost is they tend to err one way or another. For example, if you're at HR, yes. HR tends to think about people and almost to some degree focus too much on people at at the expense of all of the others or a salesperson that might be all about sales growth and so individuals and organizations even if they have a role uh, that would be oriented towards one of the business drivers if they want to be most effective they need to step back and look at the implication on all of them in HR if you're going to employ some uh, uh, employee practices people practices really understand how will this impact cash, profit, assets, and growth. And then you can make a better uh, decision. Well, good. I want to, um, you know, one of your points in your book is that you had someone um, thinking that they were doing a good job, uh, doing a good job by focusing on cost cutting, but they actually was costing the company money. So can you talk about that briefly uh, probably in 30 seconds, and then uh, I'm going to need for you to let our listeners know what you want them to know in, in the closing. Yeah. Um, so, you know, a quick example on that that's uh, cited in the book. Uh, I believe you're referring to an individual that was managing a call center. Yes. And they were so focused on improving the profit of the call center. In other words, let's make sure our call times are down. Let's make sure we're not spending uh, too much time on the phone. That they were actually disconnecting with the customer, not serving the customer well. So here was an individual who, rightfully so, was trying to improve the profit of the business, but they missed that big picture of the negative impact it was having on the customer. And so uh, while their efforts were, uh, you know, they were, had good intentions, without seeing the big picture, they were making bad decisions, not serving customers well, losing customers, and ultimately that came around to impact profit negatively. Well, that's, that's great. I'd like to thank Kevin Cope for his time and information. And for more information on Kevin Cope, you may visit his website, seeingthebigpicture.com. For our listeners, our discussion today can be summarized into four thoughts. One, take responsibility for where you are at the moment because your best thoughts have gotten you to where you are. Two, you must be willing to change to get different results in your life. Three, Create a great vision for yourself and become persistent in your pursuit of this vision. Don't let the first roadblock stop your vision. Fourth and finally, create your own happiness. Life is too short to not live it being happy. Remember, your money and your life are terrible things to waste. I would like to thank our tech director, David Tripp, for making this show possible. I would also like to thank Willie Jolly for our theme music, Mastering Your Money is recorded in the studio of WNCU, licensed to North Carolina Central University in Durham, North Carolina. You're hearing a, this valuable information on a listener-supported radio station. Please support this station with your charitable giving. Thank you in advance for sharing your treasure. This is Ed Fulbright, CPA PFS, signing off until our next exciting show to help you turbocharge your drive on the Financial Freedom Highway. Thank you for tuning in and join us next time.